All right. I am super, super excited about this conversation. Richard Reeves, thank you for joining us. I'm excited you said yes to coming on our show. Um, let's just dive right in because there's a ton of, of discussion topics. Uh, we started going into it right before hitting record and we're like, all right, we got to stop and we got to get going on this. Uh, so Richard Reeves, if, if you could just give us a little bit of background about who you are and, and what you do, please. Sure, but I'm not all that good stuff from before we hit record, right? That stays off the record, right? That now. stays off the record. We don't, oh, yeah. we don't want to tell good, anybody that's that the stuff. juicy stuff. That is. That's right. Uh, no, one of the <laughs> things about this is that, like, you just got to be open about these issues. I think so. I hope we'll get into more of the stuff we just did uh, in the run up. So I'm I'm Richard Reeves, and I'm a policy wonk by training. I've been in government scholarship. I just did a ten year stint at the Brookings Institution, which is like the kind of blue chip global think tank on policy issues. I do a lot of stuff on education, a lot of stuff on race, a lot of stuff on upward mobility. And and that actually led me to focus on boys and men. And that led me to write about boys and men. And that's now led me to do something that was definitely not in the game plan, which is to create a, a new organization, the American Institute for Boys and Men, which is the, the first and only think tank research body that is just dedicated to those issues of boys and men. So we're a few months into that journey, uh, it's exciting. Um, but I'm on a mission now around this. I think there's just a huge need and a huge space to have a fact-based, non-zero-sum, compassionate conversation about what's happening with boys and men. Yeah, you know, one of the things you open a boys, uh, a boys and men with is the idea of and I'll put it, put it in my words uh, somewhat, but but I find it fascinating, this idea that we're in such a polarized black and white cultural environment that that the argument is that you have to choose between boys and men or women, uh, girls and women. And, and what I find fascinating about this is that wouldn't even work in my house. A black and white view would not work in my household. I have a wife, I have a daughter, um, and then I have two boys. And, and right. the idea of choosing which one of them I want to succeed and which one of them I want to defend and, and honor is absolutely ridiculous. But it's it's commonplace in our society in this in this polarization of the topic. And and you highlight that beautifully throughout the book and in a, m a number of different ways, black and white, like you said, race, gender and all, all the mm -hmm. different ways. But but I'm just curious, how have we found ourselves in such an environment that that critical thought and and uh, meaningful, valuable, and compassionate discourse is is almost is the exception. Yeah, well, I think it depends who you're talking about. Honestly, I think that David, you're right. That's the kind of culture war stuff. That's the stuff that gets the attention. That's the kind of the sort of public debate. <laughs> it's very different to your family debate, right? Your household debate. And so, like normal people, don't think that there's a tension between worrying about their son and worrying about their daughter and caring equally about both. But it's just as an example of the polarizing dynamic generally about a lot of public debate, which ends up being, uh, it ends up as what you might think of as a zero sum equation, which is it's just this sense of like, if the, I, I can't give an inch, right? If I give an inch, they'll take a mile. You dug in and you're not able to concede any ground at all or to think two thoughts at once. And gender, I think, is one of the most extreme examples of that. But I think it's a, gen, a gen, general problem, right, in our public discourse is that to kind of concede, yeah, actually, maybe you're right about that. Or maybe I should change my mind about this, <laughs> right? Or on the one hand, on the other hand, or it's, it sounds boring. What's much more exciting is just being absolutely clear, single world view. Now, I will say that I have quite a lot of sympathy for those who worry that, look, there's still so much to do for women and girls that there's a legitimate concern that somehow or other this is going to displace or dilute that. Now, it's not. It doesn't have to, and it shouldn't. But I do understand that kind of reaction that a lot of women especially are going to have, which is like, really? <laughs> You've had 10,000 years? A couple of seconds where you fall behind on a couple of things, and it's like, you know, back to you, back to the man. All right. I, I get that. And I think... I. I I've come to believe, actually, this is, I'll make a general point that I don't think I've made publicly before, but I've, I've come to believe that unless you feel a degree of discomfort in a conversation or a debate, you shouldn't be allowed in it, right? If everything feels comfortable and clear to you, probably don't want to hear from you because these things are hard. We're all getting stuff wrong and changing our minds and it's difficult, right? So there's a necessary discomfort with these debates, uh, including the one around gender. We have to kind of live with that discomfort and honor it. 
I love yeah. that. I love that you highlighted that the idea of being uncomfortable. Um, and and one quote that you said, and then Stu, off to your question, that I, that I think is is so uh, relevant to the conversation to the question is, uh, you said a world of floundering men will not be one of flourishing women, or vice versa. And I just love that quote because it, it really wraps up what you just said. The idea that men floundering or women floundering, or either one of them being at a disadvantage, is good for none of us. So I love that. Thank you. All right. Yeah. It's interesting. I, when I first read your book, uh, I posted something about the book on social media. Uh, and this was probably 10 months ago, 11 months ago. And there was immediately comments, uh, specifically from women saying like, well, it's about time, you know, kind of to your point, it's about time that, uh, you know, that, that women have the opportunity to, to do better in, you know, X and X in school and jobs. And, you know, what are you, you have a daughter. One comment was like, you have a daughter. Are you not proud of everything that you're, you know, the opportunities that your daughter has? And like, it was all this kind of zero sum thinking. I'm mm -hmm. like, no, no, I have a daughter. I have a wife. Like I, I want the best for them too, but we can kind of have both here. Right. And it's, it's an interesting conversation. And so for our audience, for our listeners who, who haven't read the book yet, right. Who, uh, haven't really experienced this stuff. Like what is going on with boys and men? What is going on with male inequality, uh, that you've seen with data? Yeah. There's a few, a few things that really trip me up as I was kind of reading them, you know, you hit data points sometimes when you're reading. So I'd be sitting there in my office at the Brookings Institution and so reading appendix three of a report and going, wait, wait, what? <laughs> right? And that's like, that's how you make your living. And, and, and actually a lot of these trends were just sufficiently troubling for me to think, Hey, why aren't we talking more about this? And then the answer to that question, I think is part of what we were just talking about, which is this discomfort with raising it. But to just put some numbers on this, and it's actually relevant to this concern about do we care about inequality both ways. So at higher education now, a lot of people will know that colleges in the US are now significantly more they're skewed towards female. So men have fallen a long way behind women in college campuses. So it's about 60, 40 now in favor of women in higher education. And that's actually a slightly bigger gap than we had in the 70s when it was the other way around. And actually in the 70s, we did a bunch of stuff to help women as we should have done because of that gender gap, right? So it's not true It's not true that we didn't care about the gender gap the other way around. And that reflects what happens in high school, like two thirds of the best high schoolers ranked by grade are, are girls, two thirds of those most struggling are boys. But then you get these other data points, like in education, I'll give you one that just like, you go, wait, what? And you double check it and you get someone else to check it, which is that 23% of boys in the US school system have been diagnosed with a developmental disability. 23%. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I, mean, I just can't be right. It's like moments where you're like, hold on, hold on. That's twice as many as there are girls. That doesn't feel right. Or any education system that says like one in four of a certain group are quotes disabled. And so you see that. You also see in wages, like most men actually earning a bit less than most men did a few decades ago, earning less. That's huge in terms of its downstream cultural significance. And again, it's not to say that we don't want women, more women going to college. We do. We want women earning more. We do. But we also don't want men earning less. And we don't want what we've seen, which is a million fewer men enrolling in college now than 10 years ago, right? A million drop, right? So it's back to this kind of sense of like, you, you've got to pay attention to both sides of this coin. And then the other huge change i think uh, has been in kind of family life and 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 i know we're going to get into i hope we'll get into given your interests around social relationships and so on too but but the kind of share of dads who are not in their kids lives who struggle to be in their kids lives and 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 just the profound consequences of that and it's something that i just really got wrong actually i'll say this now that like i was talking about my the work i'd done in my book and i talk about how important fathers are for their kids Right, for the kids' mental health, like that dad's the relationship with your dad when you're a 16 year old girl predicts how you're going to be as a, your mental health as a 30 year old woman. You see better out, no, just across the board, better. No, dad's matter, period. There's no debate about that in social science anymore. But I gave this talk about this, and this dad, this guy came up to me afterwards and he was in tears and he said, I, I agree with what you've said, but you talk about dads as if they're just a means to an end. Dads matter because they're good for their kids' outcomes, he said. But being a dad is the most important thing in my life to me. 
What about the value of just being a father for fathers and the importance of fatherhood? And I had this profound moment of thinking how badly I got that wrong. But I just missed the importance of fatherhood for fathers as well. And I think that's really missing in our culture right now too, a kind of the valuing of fathers uh, in policy, but also in our culture. So those are some of the things that led me to, to this place. Yeah, that's uh that gave me pause as you said that it kind of gave me an emotional um reaction as well because I think but I think there's a it's fascinating to me that we're told most of the data it, it, it's progression. I think there's a lot of data now talking about the the means to the end, right? And that's something that I believe was missing in the conversation prior. And then you just uh, you just highlighted a way to take the conversation even further, right? Into to the individualized. And, and in your book, you talk about uh, this idea of identities and and um, mm. you know the the mm. I'm, I'm I'm forgetting the the specific phrase, but basically the more opportunities you have to express an identity is an indication of mental health, right? Yes. And I think a lot of us, uh, you know that that really I had to read that over and over because I was like, man, there's an aspect here. That because one of the things you highlighted for for dads was the the perceived importance to mothers, <clears throat> excuse me, and to or to to mothers and fathers of their children and the you know broke down into percentage. But it was it was fascinating to me because I was like, man, I, I really this work that Stu and I are doing, kids are a huge emphasis, right? And, and in my life, and hours a week spent is a huge huge emphasis, and I come away from it very fulfilled and exhausted and all all the things that you you do as a dad. But it also it's interesting how I even struggled to make the connection of how important being a dad is to me and it, important for, you know, how, how difficult it was for me to make the, to disconnect of me being an ends for them and always thinking about, I want this for my kids health. And I've not verbalized until you just said that this is important for my health. And is that just yes. a, is that like a, a man, like a thing that we've been told? Is it a story you've been told? Is that, a, a, you know, the evolution of us being a, a particular role that, that you highlight is changing? Like what has caused us to be so uh, reticent to, to admit, like, I love being a dad. This is mm -hmm. a goal of my life. Many men don't, they, they don't, unless pressed, they don't say, list that as the top things of, of life goals. Why is that? Yeah. Well, I think one of the, consequences of our kind of outdated view those old views about kind of men and women and dads and as and moms has been to create a set of cultural archetypes and stories that if they ever were valuable certainly aren't now right and so some of those would be like i remember somebody once saying to me that you know moms know the names of their children's dearest friends and fiercest enemies they know their greatest hopes and their kind of greatest fears and fathers are vaguely aware that there are smaller people in the house right and it's like a classic sort of example of that that's sort of, that sort of joke right similarly around marriage you kind of get the sense of the kind of ball and chain and like women are trying to get men to be married and he's gonna to have to give up all this freedom and all that stuff right and so these are these are tropes and to the extent that they were ever true they're certainly not true now it's very striking to me that actually men are a bit more likely to say that they're not spending en enough time with their kids compared to at work. And you've just seen actually men now being more likely to say that marriage is important to them, more likely than women. So American men today are now more likely to say marriage is important to them than American women are. So this is, what is that getting at? I think it's getting at the sense that kind of men do know that they're going to be fulfilled and have purpose from kind of being a dad, being a partner, being a spouse, being in relationships with people. And so this whole idea of, about the kind of lone ranger, the cowboy who you have to kind of trap into marriage, and then he's kind of reluctant and he's a distant father, wait till your father gets home stuff, is BS, actually. But it's interesting that it's kind of BS that's kind of re-emerging in some kind of reactionary spaces now, even though it is so far from the lived experience of most of us, myself included, I'm exactly the same as you guys, hugely important, like being a dad. The term that you, you forgot, David, was cognitive self-complexity and shame on you for not storing that one away cognitive why self why did what, that i don't know why that slipped my mind and i apologize to, well, to you know, well i think it shows it shows a lack of 
cognitive self complexity in you. A hundred percent. Right. <laughs> but, but, but it's a really great idea with a, with a terrible academic name, which is like, basically what it is, is like, from, in terms of your mental health, it's better to not put all your, all your eggs in one basket. It's just like investing. Right. And the trouble is that the kind of historic roles of men have put too many of our mental health eggs in the basket of work and money, right. To probably stretch the metaphor too far. Whereas with women, they kind of got a better sense of like, well, I'm also a mom, I'm also a friend, I'm also a community member. They have kind of different, they're more multidimensional in that sense. And that's not because of anything kind of inherent. It's just because of the way our roles have developed. And I think that men are really struggling now. A lot of us are really struggling to kind of have more of that complexity, more of that sense of like, you know what, I'm really doing badly at work right now, but I'm killing it as a dad, right? Uh, and that's great. And I'm going to get, and I'm going to get enough of my sense of worth and purpose from that aspect of my life rather than from just the narrowly defined one of previous generations. So that's a, a great opportunity, but I think this is real lag that a lot of us are feeling as we try and catch up with these new opportunities. I, I heard once that, uh, the difference between men and women are if, if a man introduces himself to another man and is asking, you know, about themselves, a man will say, what do you do? Hmm. And, and the woman will we'll ask, who do you know? Mm. And the women are all about relationships and the men are all about, you know, their primary role as a, as a worker, right. As a, as a, as a, uh, money provider, as a breadwinner, right. It's just, what do you do? And they find identity in that. And so, you know, to that point, like what's the causation of, of this, of this male inequality in the book, you know, you talk about the education system, you talk about the labor force, you talk about, this dad deficit, what is all that stemming from? Yeah, it's it's really tempting to find sort of single causes yeah. for sort of multiple different outcomes. And I'm I'm reluctant to do that too much because I think, for example, like the reason why a 15-year-old boy, a 16-year-old boy is just much more likely to be struggling in school right now is not obviously and directly the same reason that a 35 year old man is struggling in the labor market now of course there are links or, or a 45 year old man is struggling to remain in this kid's lives now it's not that they're not linked they are linked in in kind of in sort of so social sciencey ways but but i think what's happening is that multiple forces have basically kind of come in at once you've seen huge deindustrialization and massive wage inequality in the labor market I think you've seen the education system completely separately, or almost completely separately, just become a bit less boy friendly, you know, less recess, less vocational, fewer male teachers, et cetera. Um, and you've seen this kind of rise in women's independence, which has meant that the family form has changed. But they're not one isn't one, it isn't kind of one arrow going all the way through. But I would say I think there is one theme. I wouldn't say it's a single cause, but I would say that there's a connecting theme which is that the definition of mature masculinity is up for grabs very uncertain very very it's like the you know a kaleidoscope that thing you shake right and then it resettles but it's still being shaken right now and so i think what's happened is that we've kind of torn up the old signpost the old script for masculinity and femininity but we replace the old feminine one with a really empowering new liberating one for women and girls. I think there's a very clear message being sent to women and girls now about independence, autonomy, strength, education, et cetera. And we tore up the old male one about being head of household, breadwinner, et cetera, and we didn't replace it. And I think that's created a real vacuum that's a kind of uncertainty and drift. And, and I think just a lot of men and boys are just like, there's a huge question mark next to what does it mean to be a man now? <laughs> Whereas it's not the same for women. It's become more expansive. It's like kind of whatever you want it to be, right? <laughs> and that's not, doesn't feel true right now, like that for a lot of boys and men now. So I don't think that's what's causing the low GPA of like at boys. I don't, so again, I want to emphasize, I'm not trying to say I have this totalizing cause. That would have made, that would have made for a better selling book probably. Like if you can <laughs> identify one thing that's causing everything, then yeah. you've got a you've got a better, you know, less boring book. But unfortunately, I think life is rarely that straightforward. Well, I will uh at risk of arguing and disagreeing with uh with our guest, I would say it is absolutely not a boring book. Uh it was fascinating to me. And and I actually I appreciate the complexity 
of the issue and it forces you to think and, and also to individualize, right? Okay, where yeah. am I? What are the things that are impacting me? Because it's not going to be the same things that impact Stuart and, and our households are different. And the way that I now project my 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 fatherhood and my my um uh, you know legacy is not not something I'm not only important, it's it's for the benefit of the kids. How do I how do I adjust that? How do I address that? And, and help them to be the best humans they, they can be. And as you pointed out, the best human I can be, because part of that is my identity as a dad, right? And and one of the things that, um, you know, I love that you, I, I heard it, I can't remember who, uh, who, who spoke on it, but he mentioned that the reason there's a, such a rise in um, just these, these, these false senses of these false definitions of masculinity and why there's a rise in popularity and these people like uh, Tate and these different folks that, that, that don't appeal to me. Um, but there's a rise in popularity for these folks because boys are searching boys are, are actually, it was, a, it was an article in the Atlantic by a woman written about men. It was fascinating. It was a really good article, but mm -hmm. she's like, these guys are rising to prominence because boys do not have, and a lot of men have not had a, mature definition of a definition of mature masculinity of which to emulate. And so I, I think that is, is fascinating. Mm. Um, I want to change gears slightly. Are you sure that wasn't and, Christine Ember's essay in the Washington post? Uh, I know, I know it was the Atlantic, but okay. I don't, right. cause I don't read Washington post, but, but it was, I'll have to find it. And, and yeah, I'll well, I would just, I would notes. take the opportunity to point people. Christine Ember had, um, a long essay in the post about a year ago is called men are lost. Here's a way out of the wilderness, which basically I think is mm. kind of making some of these similar points. Yeah. No, yeah, it was, it was very similar. And, and she was, she was talking about it from the perspective of a woman looking to um, looking at, at man, at men and, and looking to get married and, and just mm. seeing just her observations and what she was observing. And, and she basically it was fatigue of, of, of grown boys, right? Boys and men's body. And she just was fatigued of it and, and was highlighting, but from a very, um, she, she was very, uh, I, I think she, she was highlighting this issue with men from a very compassionate place and how it had an impact on, on young women as well. Uh, back to your quote, right? Floundering men is not that that's not, right. the, that's not what we want. Uh, I want to change gears slightly because one, another thing that we see a lot, uh, as veterans, is is mental health issues and and a lot of these vets the proponents of them that you know 22 a day that that uh take their own lives are are men and there's a strong sense of identity in that and to think that they're completely unrelated there's no correlation between this and their identity as men would i think would be uh, a, a false presumption on our part and and one of the things that i am so passionate about is this idea that we have control of a lot of these things, like if we made more friends, right, we'd have to make more friends. Um, it would help our mental health. There's actions we can take to help us. And, and there's very specific things. And I'm curious, you know, you have a ton of solutions that you rent, recommend in your book. And, and I absolutely love it. Um, from an individual perspective, what are the things we can do? What are the things that are independent of of government or other schools stepping? All these things, all these programs are, are critical. I, I agree with you there. But what are the things we can do as individuals to help us get a, a better sense of self, a better sense of a definition of masculinity, a better sense of of passing this on to our boys to to start curtailing some of the the you know in in, in a lot of cases extreme that you point out um actions that we take even to to the point of, of taking our own lives right what can we do about it devoid of other uh, resources yeah well thank you for that question let me let, let me also take the opportunity to thank you both for your service both in the military and your service now in in this conversation i actually just uh i've just hired someone to join my team at, at the institute who is a naval officer uh, he's, still, he's a veteran. He's still in the reserves. So he's just getting off a submarine somewhere near Japan, apparently, in order to come join us. So uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to have told you that. I may have just done something. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's okay. no. You're, you're good. As as a guy who used to ride subs, you're you're fine. You're fine. I mean, like it's under the <laughs> it's under the water, right? No one like I, no I big deal. Just, I didn't give a I didn't give like a <laughs> GPS thing. I'm like. So the way um, and if if you like, had one, that would be problematic. If you had a GPS was, location, would, that, yeah. that would be problematic. <laughs> That's right. If I actually knew where he was. Um, so I actually, I, I like, I don't know, this quote from uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, the British writer and theologian, just came into my mind as a way to get into this, which is a, a this great line. 
And it was actually more specifically about developing a Christian ethos. But I think it's very relevant to this conversation too. And what he said was, the goal is not to think less of yourself. It is to think of yourself less. And actually, I think we get so trapped in our own kind of interior or interiority, right? Inside ourselves, right? And, um, and very often, I think the solution to the struggles that, that many, if not most of us will have is not to think our way out of what's happening inside of ourselves, but think of somebody else instead and to do something for somebody else instead. There's this lovely essay recently in the Bulwark, which is called Be the Crossing Guard. And it was like, you know, there's all this stuff happening and you don't know what to do this stuff. Just go and volunteer to be the crossing guard. Like I'm starting a, a scout group where I, where I am locally, try to do my bit for my... And actually when I kind of find myself like... And these are definitely some issues that I've struggled with myself too, especially some depression, which is that sense of kind of turning inward, right? What's the the best solution to that? And to long-term kind of mental health is to turn outward, not to deny the need to do the interior work, not to deny, not to be against any of that. Or, but, but it's always seems to me that that's the solution is in relationships, and so that is why friendship and the Surgeon General has done amazing work on this. Why isolation is literally fatal, right? More more so than whatever it is, fifteen cigarettes a day. To be lonely is more damaging to your physical health, but in terms of your mental health, we see this kind of isolation and. It's hard. I think it's particularly hard for men for reasons that we could spend, you know, 10,000 years debating <laughs> nature, nurture, et cetera. But I just noticed in my own friendships too, it's like, it's just a little bit harder for us to be direct and intentional about our relationship maintenance than it is for women it just is. And so that that's not an excuse. It's a call to just be a little bit better about it, a bit more thoughtful about it. And so that's, a, I mean, just investing in your relationships is the best way to invest in your own mental health. But but it's weird, like you don't, that's not why you do it. If you're doing it just for that reason, say, I know, I'll make friends with David and Stu so that I'm less depressed. No, that doesn't work. It's just get out of yourself a little bit, right? There's this kind of nice line, going too long about this, but... um. In English, English, there's this phrase for kind of when you get drunk, um, which is to get out of your head. Get out of your head. There's also a phrase that probably is more familiar. It's like when you're not quite right, you're beside yourself. You're not in yourself, you're beside yourself. Oh, he's beside yeah. himself. And what that means is that somehow we've just like either deliberately or accidentally just gotten out of ourselves. You know, and so I think that's part of the attraction of kind of those addictions is it gets us out of ourselves. <laughs> And so the solution is to find other ways to get out of our heads, out of ourselves, other than those more destructive ones. And that is through relationships and it's through service and it's through the generation of a surplus. Like a, one of my definition of mature masculinity, if I'm forced to give one, is that you generate more than you need for your own survival. You generate a surplus. You give more than you get. That's the moment you go. That's the moment you go from boy to man. You're giving more than you're getting. That's getting harder and harder to do um, because of, so I just started reading The Anxious Generation mm. by Jonathan Haidt, and um, you mentioned him before recording, mm. and there's a certain generation that has only been consumed internally, right? It is on screens all the time that is all about the selfie, that is all about the social media, that's all about, uh, you know, the internal stuff, right? And and their friends are, are friends online in a different country. The number of friends they have is their number of Facebook friends and the number of likes and the hearts and, and all of these things. And so how do we, how do we get past that? How do we get, hmm. you know, that generation? Um, because there are there's data now from from this book that shows that this is causing anxiety and depression. This is causing all these mental illnesses. So how can we get out of that? Yeah, well, I have to give an advert to Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt's piece for us about boys, yeah. why he's worried about boys. And there's a very good chapter in his book specifically on boys and the way the the interaction of technology and mental health is playing is a bit different for boys and girls and young men and young women and Actually, interestingly, for girls, it is the very relational nature of the social media that's causing the harm, 
right? It's comparing yourself body image wise. It's relational bullying. It's the, basically, it's the kind of mean girls phenomenon amplified through social media because girls bully relationally much more than physically. Whereas for men, the technological impact of the, of the change of the last few years has been more about isolation. It's been to corrode relationships rather than weaponize them. And what it's done is it's crowded out some of the kind of in real life stuff we would otherwise have done. And so I actually think that the, the specific kinds of social media that girls are more inclined to be using, TikTok especially, but or Instagram, the kind of, is just directly damaging. Whereas with boys, it's much more like to be gaming, pornography, et cetera. And there's not as much evidence for direct damage from those. And in fact, gaming can be great, you know, just as a way to kind of maintain friendships and so on too. Um uh, you know, this is obviously there's a small minority who kind of have addiction problems with both of those, but the problem is less what they're doing online. It's what they're not doing while they are online. And what we are not doing while we're online is in real life friendships, service, in community, in kind of embodied relationships with people. So it's more of a displacement problem, I think, for boys. And I think that's why we see these rates of isolation being higher among young men and young women. So Daniel Cox's work uh, at AI that I've kind of drawn on a bit shows that like 15% of young men don't have a close friend and that's much higher than for young women. And it's, that's just because this technology shock is kind of playing out in ways that isolate men more or maybe to put it differently, to make isolation more possible. Or, um, uh, it's, it gives us a place to retreat to, basically. I'm using, if I use military analogy here, I think it's like technology gives displaced uncertain un, you know young men boys and young men it gives us somewhere to retreat to uh where we can kind of run some kind of rear guard in our own mental health but in the long run it's not going to help because the things that are going to give us long run satisfaction are in the real world well, yeah and you did an awesome uh about 14 15 minute video on friendship and and I would encourage all our listeners to to check that out it's on um big think uh is is was the umbrella organization they have a lot of really really powerful things on there powerful thinkers and and smart men and women and your your talk on friendship was fascinating because you know and one of the lines that stuck out to me that I that I absolutely loved is is uh you, you mentioned how friendships don't form themselves friendship is what you say friendship is not a flower that just blooms but it's more like a woodworking project. And, and it really, it, it struck me because I'm, I, when I look around me, I think a lot of people, especially as you get older, think, well, it, you know, it, this is, it should be this natural, like a uh, love at first sight thing, even in friendship, right? It should be this thing that just, it should just pop. It should just bloom. Like Stu and I have been friends. We've been, we're still working on our friendship and it's been 25 years uh, since we started this thing, right? And I would still say he's probably not that great of a friend, but but he's he's getting there. He's getting better. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. At, at like the 50 year mark, I think, you know, spot on. But yeah. but but the point is, is it's not, it's, it's hard. And you highlight, you just mentioned it, this idea of isolation. And I'm just curious, you mentioned shame as well as being something. And, and we had a guest on previously uh, talking about porn addiction and shame was a huge part and isolation were a huge parts of the cycle to, right. to that, that, that kept you in it. And I'm just curious from from a, you know, this this idea of isolation and this idea of shame, are those more prominent and more powerful in men that keeps them in these escapic, escapist activities? And, and and how like how can we very practically, you know, you talk about vulnerability a lot too. How can we very practically allow ourselves to be more vulnerable for our own good? Yeah, well. <laughs> I don't have a great answer. Otherwise I'd have done a better job with my own friendships. Right. And um, if any of my close friends are watching this, and in fact, I've had this feedback from sometimes too, which was that I'm definitely not a world leader in maintaining and cultivating friendships. Although I'm trying to get a lot better. Um, and actually I'm doing, you know, I'm doing stuff like, I'll give you kind of one example from my, my personal life. And then I'll talk about the shame thing. It's like, so this, I have this thing, my closest friend in the UK, right, is to, so he's much better at doing the kind of initiating contact and, and doing stuff than, than vice versa. And I'm always using the excuse of busyness and so on, right? And we've talked about this kind of in a friend, friendship. Every, every once a week, he goes and plays soccer. And he drives to soccer and he drives back. And what we've done is we've put in a standing calendar thing on both our calendars when he's driving to and when he's driving from. 
And we can't always do it. Very often we're just like, hey, I'm on another call right now, kind of busy, but it's there. Comes up on my calendar, Sp speak to Simon, right? And it's probably tripled the number of times we just catch up with each other, right? And it's not, it's 20 minutes, 30 minutes, it, but it means you haven't got this kind of accumulated thing, right? It's just that touch point. And I just, again, I think, I, I tell women that and they're like, well, why do you need to calendar it? Why don't you just call each other? And I'm like, because we are men. <laughs> like, I don't know what to say, to say to you, but but I think the shame point is really interesting. And I think particularly around something like pornography, but but also maybe kind of just more broadly, a lot of the, like, either stuff that men are kind of thinking, doing online, like they are full of shame around a lot of it. And some some, a lot of it unjustified. And they just feel like their mums, the girls they know, maybe some of that are just going to be like rolling their eyes or wagging their fingers or like, what's wrong with you? Um, why are you looking at that stuff? Why are you listening to that stuff? What's wrong? And, I, and so I think actually I haven't got any evidence on shame, but I, I am, I am struck by how many kind of young men just like feel un unwilling or unable to talk about some of what they're doing or struggling with for precisely that reason, because of how people will look at them. Um, I don't have a good solution to it other than for us to try and create better spaces. I mean, porn is a particular, I, I haven't, didn't see your episode on that. Porn is a really interesting, like you can't do good studies on porn because there's no control group. Right. Like there, you know, you, so it's a problem. Um, but when people try try and talk about like how do we think there's a very good book your your brain on porn, and um, when we try and talk about like teenage boys, what does it mean for sex ed? What does it mean for how we think about what, how we're talking to our boys about that? And actually, kind of a lot of boys and young men feel like like there's porn and then there's all the consent stuff, and that's kind of it. Sex education consists of Pornhub and then lectures about what not to do. I'm not saying the latter aren't important, but it's like okay, but like they're going to consume porn. Question is how, what kind, what does that mean, etc. The like, Lorraine, can you reduce it and maybe or maybe move away from it? But you know, like there's, there's the naivety on both. There's sort of naivety on all sides on this issue. And so, actually, just think rethinking what our sex ed curriculum looks like for a world of high definition pornography is something that it's very few people are willing to go there. That's scary, and it's so accessible. I mean. You know, as soon this as before AI, I mean, like once AI gets hold of it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and to the point of uh, Jonathan Haidt's book about, uh, like, kids are seeing porn at what eight, nine, ten years old, uh, maybe even earlier. You know, if they're around phones and computers, it's just it's everywhere. Yeah. And to that to that point about friendship recession, um, you know, in that video, you talk a lot about, uh, you know, some of the other cultural you know changes of of and the impact uh, to friendship you know you talk about um geographic mobility you know, like we're moving all the time for new jobs you're talking about mm -hmm. uh us being around kids more like and and that that kind of goes into the anxious things I, the anxious generation and uh we had lenore skenazy i don't know if you know her but uh, mm, yes um you right. know, the helicopter parenting, right? Mm -hmm. Like having to be around the kids all the time and not like letting them go and do their own thing and play outside on their own because now we can all have time for friends because we have to parent all the time, right? Uh, careerism, workism, we've seen that a lot in our field in, in kind of the real estate entrepreneur industry, just always focus, hustle and grind, always working. And we don't have, to your point, we don't put it on the calendar. We don't put the priority of putting something on the calendar to go do something with friends. Um, mm. so all these things it's 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 interesting how they kind of all come for circle together to have this major impact yeah well, where Which, i think john, john and gene uh twenge and others have really just highlighted some of the structural stuff we can do and i agree with a lot of what they say about schools and better regulation etc but but i also think there is this, as you mentioned this kind of you've had Lenore, but the hyper the, there's the kind of hyper vigilant parenting but there's also just the kind of hyper investment parenting there's the there's the kind of race for the top um, which means that just kind of hanging out with your friends and developing those skills, which do take unstructured time. You know, I actually kind of as adolescents, as kids in adolescence, you don't want to be calendaring it. You just want it to be unfolding organically. Um, but, you know, if you're too busy trying to become the best lacrosse player so that you can get a D2 scholarship to an elite, I don't, I don't even like whatever, um, then it does it squeezes out that time. And so I actually 
I really worry about the way we that actually as parents, I think we have a responsibility to kind of get off our kids' backs quite a lot, um, not schedule them too much and give them just more space to just to hang out and go hang with their friends. Um, but that seems terribly unproductive and kind of professional, successful parents who've got high ambitions for their kids very often fall into the trap of seeing their kids as units of future human capital and maximizing the investment. Now, I'm not saying that's all they see them as, but they do see them as that. Um, and they're thinking about kind of like the marginal value of each hour their, their kids are spending. And that's, well, that's a quick way to destroy childhood, to put it really bluntly. Yeah. Yeah. No longer are the days of uh, the sandlot where you just kick the kids out all summer long and they leave it at, at, at uh, sunrise and then don't come back until, you know, sunset. Well, friendship takes friendship takes time, right? I mean, that's the thing. There's all kinds of other stuff in there too, unmonitored, risky play, kind of et cetera. But, but above all, it takes time. And so this time squeeze that a lot of people kind of feel. And I think that's off, often what happens to a lot of men too. And it comes back to the conversation we were having a moment ago, which is that I think a lot of men feel like, particularly once they're dads, you know, this was a big issue for me. It's like, okay, you're very busy at work. You're very busy with your kids. You're trying to keep, you know, you're trying to keep your marriage going. Like, I'm sorry, guys, but friends are like, you just fall off the agenda, right? And so I think there's a particularly difficult period um, when you're kind of trying to pursue pursue work and raise kids and sustain probably a much more complex and egalitarian marriage than in the past as well. So it's like a, it's a lot of time, right? And so like, dude, you know, so I, I, I just things as simple as every year, make sure you spend some time with your friends, right? I can do that with my, we just go hiking once a year, right? And it's just like, at least we know we're going to have those uh, those days together hiking and cooking hike and it's only once a year but i we made that an inviolable commitment like whatever else was happening like we were going to do that um and that's that was that, that's honestly kept some of my friendships that, with that key group of friends i'm sure that our friendships have, have been sustained because partly just because of that at least at least we know we're going to spend a few days together once a year so minimum do that yeah i love that and 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 i want to encourage our listeners too i mean you know Stu and i uh pretty pretty busy individuals but we have uh we've adjusted our calendar to once a week we do something fun it's thursdays and, and i'll tell you what's fascinating to me is that everybody in our circles knows right like my wife's like uh hey can you do the thing on thursday oh wait never mind i know you and Stu are going to be doing a thing and i'm and it's there's no contention uh, a lot of my friends, uh, you know, when they're like, "Hey, let's do," can we set up a call for this thing? Oh, it's Thursday, I can't do it because I know you're with, you know, you know, you're with your uh, your work wife, Stu. Like, it's it's just mm -hmm. a very it's very fascinating how when you start putting these things on the calendar, not only do you honor them, especially as men, not only do you honor them, but but it starts becoming the norm for that for the circle around you, and and they they acknowledge and recognize that as well. And it's yeah. it's a it's an amazing thing for relationship, and and it's again to the kids. Yeah teaching them that right yes hey, they go see spend dad time. doing that go they spend see, time yeah they see dad doing that with his friends then also it'll you probably talk about fathering and so you kind of act to some extent all right like to support each other as well as just kind of shooting the breeze and, and so on too and so I, I i actually have come to believe that male friendship requires a bit more structure than female friendship right and again long argument about why just think it's true. And so I think it needs institutions. It needs schedules. It just, it doesn't happen as organically or naturally as female friendship does. And there are all kinds of reasons that could be true for evolutionary reasons. There's all kinds of reasons that could be true for socialized reasons. It doesn't matter, but it seems true. Right. And that's why, I mean, you know, this whole thing about like talking shoulder to shoulder as opposed to face to face. Mm. I think that's true again on the average. And it's like, for my money, it's the only explanation for golf. Like, what are these guys doing? All right. And the answer is they're being friends and they and actually when a guy when a guy's ridiculous when, game ever. Completely. Oscar Wilde, good walk, spoiled. That's where I am on it. But nonetheless, right, <laughs> if you see a if you see a guy like standing next to another guy, not facing him, but next to him, and he says, Do you think I do you think I should use the five iron for this? What he's actually saying is, I love you. Right, but that's tough for men to say. And so rather than saying, I love you, we say, do you think I should use the fire line? And I'm being a little bit unfair and excited, but do you know what I mean? It's like, it comes about as a result of these shared activities, right? And it comes about as a result of kind of doing stuff together, whether that's gaming or golfing or fishing or walking or kind of, we're just not as good. Like, I, I, so everyone listening to this, once I've told you this, you probably won't be able to stop seeing it. 
go into a coffee shop and look around at how many people are sitting staring at each other with a cup of coffee and it will be mostly women mostly women not there'll be no men but like if there is there are two people with a cup of coffee in front of them staring directly in each other's faces it'll be women right uh but with guys we and that that's that is important for therapists to know it's important for everybody else to know um that we just communicate a little bit differently fascinating that's great. uh well I know you're a busy man, and uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. I know we could probably go for another hour. Uh, I want to uh, lead our listeners to to go find out more about you, read your books. What's the best place to find all of your information and, and resources? Well, I'd encourage them to go to the American Institute uh, for Boys and Men, which is a, just AIBM.org. Uh, and I have a sub stack, which is of boys and men, where I'm posting pretty regularly some of the stuff uh, that I'm up to. Obviously, I'm on all the usual social media places uh and there's a v in the middle of my name richard richard v reeve so any of those places you can find my stuff this is excellent well uh your book is fantastic your ted talks are fantastic all the videos um man it's just it's just so much good information we'll put all of that information in the show notes uh thank you for coming on the show this was a really really great conversation thank you for having me guys and gals reach out to richard uh grab his uh information and uh Hey, let's all go take uncommon action uh, to be better men and better women. Thanks, Richard. Thanks again. Thank you, Richard.